Good evening. My name is Mark, and the topic of tonight is going to be the real cosmic Christ. The real cosmic Christ. If you've done any thinking about New Age pagan thought, you've heard of the cosmic Christ, or cosmic consciousness, or the cosmic Christ consciousness. So I try, chose that title, the real cosmic Christ, for a reason. Well, I thought it might raise some eyebrows and maybe get some attention and get somebody to listen to it. In as brief a span as possible, I want to explain why Jesus of Nazareth, the incarnation of the second person of the Trinity, is the true cosmic Christ, in who he is and in his work, both in creation and redemption which are cosmic or universal, indeed infinite in scope. You know, really, it's a shame that the New Age has co-opted a powerful and vital aspect of the person and work of the Lord Jesus. And so we have tended to shy away from using a perfectly good term like the cosmic Christ. In New Age pagan thought, the notion of the cosmic Christ or cosmic Christ consciousness is also vital to much of its thinking or conceptualization at the heart of countless, and I mean countless expressions in New Age, is the idea of denying the distinction between the Creator and the creation. So there's some universal principle which expresses itself throughout the universe, like the cosmic Christ. The universe is God, and God is the universe. It's known as panentheism. There are innumerable and a bewildering array of expressions of pagan or New Age thought, and it can get really confusing. But there is a common motif, in fact, a defining hallmark, of these countless expressions of pagan and New Age um, thoughts and religions, the, the number one defining hallmark of all of them is the denial of God as being transcendent or distinct from his creation. So that brings into sharp focus the main issue at stake in its main error, which should bring clarity to a vast array of differing beliefs. You know, and in Romans 1, 18 through 25, if we had the time, we would see the process of the exchanging of the truth of God for the lie, which is worshiping creation instead of the creator. And in various ways, the New Age cosmic Christ plays into this idolatry. Perhaps the easiest way to put it, y'all, is that the Bible sees that there are two kinds of reality. And pagan sees that there's only one kind of reality, only one stuff. We see God in everything else. So we can call that twoism. And paganism sees God and everything else is the same stuff. Oneism. So, it's one versus two. That sums up the difference between the truth of the Bible and, on the one hand, and paganism and New Age on the other hand, or between heaven and hell. Actually, the real Christ is infinitely beyond cosmic because he created the cosmos, but nevertheless, it's still a good name, as we'll see. My intent is not to elucidate the details of the New Age version of the Cosmic Christ, but instead the true version of the Cosmic Christ, and thus empowering believers and seekers to then see through the counterfeit. I'm intentionally making this short, so it will not be it won't be an exhaustive analysis of the topic, but just an introduction. And I want to um, divide this into two main sections, the person of Christ and the work of Christ. Both affect each other directly.
because a divine Christ can work cosmically, and the cosmic work of Christ sheds light on who Christ is. Let me begin by reading um, from Colossians, first chapter, starting at uh, verse 16. Chapter, chapter 1, verse 16, sorry. For by him, that is Christ, all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities. Do you see the cosmic nature of this, this uh, language here? All things were created through him and for him. And he is before all things, and in him all things hold together. And he is the head of the body of the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in everything he might have preeminent, be preeminent. For in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell, and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of his cross. Colossians 1, 16-20. And then jumping to Colossians 2, See to it that no one takes you captive by philosophy and empty deceit, according to human tradition, according to the elemental spirits of the world, and not according to Christ. For in him the whole fullness of deity dwells bodily, and you have been filled in him who is the head of all rule and authority. He disarmed the rulers and authorities and put them to open shame by triumphing over them in him. And now, one more from Daniel. The Son of Man is given dominion. Quote, I saw in the night visions, and behold, with the clouds of heaven, that's a sign of a theophany, there came one like a son of man, and he came to the Ancient of Days and was presented before him. And to him was given dominion and glory and a kingdom, and that all peoples, nations, and languages should, should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion, which shall not pass away, and his kingdom one that shall not be destroyed. This is basically an interaction between the Father and the Son. In the Old Testament, the phrase Son of Man had two meanings. It usually meant a human being. Uh, such as in the book of Ezekiel, where that phrase is used about 90 times, and it basically meant um, being as a human being as opposed to the su supreme being. But it also had a second meaning, as in this Daniel passage, this Son of Man is also clearly not only human, but also divine. Uh, the language there is unmistakable. The Son is approaching the Father. The imagery in this text shows that this Son of Man is manifestly God. His authority is cosmic in scope, infinitely beyond that. And I say this reverently, but it, it, the picture here and what was being anticipated by pious Jews prior to the coming of the Messiah was that the Son of Man was going to be something of a cosmic hitman who would do serious damage to gods and our enemies, sin, Satan, and death. The cosmic Christ is God, and as you may know, the Son of Man was Jesus' favorite name for himself. But as we can see from this text in um, Daniel, this is not meek and mild Jesus. This is um, a man, a divine man, on a mission, a, a mission of, um, of immense proportions and um, one with um, deadly consequences for his enemies. The deity of the Son of Man is clarified in this path, in the passage which we read in Colossians, where Christ is seen as a transcendent Lord, the creator of and distinct from his creation. In verse 119 and 2.9, Christ's full deity is spelled out clearly. So the cosmic Christ is the second person of the Holy Trinity, fully God and fully man. 
those go back and if you would please and look at those two verses and it's just so clear as to Christ's deity. So because of the person of the cosmic Christ, that he is the second person in eternity, his full deity and full humanity, we can now get a clear picture of his work. In Colossians 1.16, the cosmic Christ created the cosmos. Paul makes it a, it a point to show that no aspect of creation is beyond the scope of his sovereign creating power. And he uses the language of the day that um, emphasized the, the cosmic nature of his creation, including evil supernatural powers. He did not create them as being evil. They rebelled, him, rebelled against him by committing cosmic treason, uh, just as we did. But they are still remain subject to his cosmic authority. Okay, Satan and his demons must. They're on a sure leash. Further, the cosmic Christ means that the cosmos was made for him. He not only owns every inch of the cosmos legally by virtue of creation, but it exists primarily for his glory. However, he also created the cosmos so that his image bearers, us, would enjoy it and lovingly rule over it as his vice regents. Now, when we talk about it being created for his purpose, that's what we need to first ask. Um, not why is such and such happening to me, but the first question we should ask when we're reading the Bible is, what does it say about God? And then how to apply it to our situation. But let's move on. In addition, the work of the cosmic Christ entails his moment-by-moment -moment upholding of every molecule of the, of the cosmos. Verse 17, he upholds the universe, the cosmos. Um, this is seen also in Hebrews 1.3. This is not an impersonal force which glues the cosmos together, but it's the personal God, the absolute, infinite, personal God, the second person of the Trinity, who upholds the cosmos and prevents it from spiraling into chaos or even non-existence. It is God himself who holds the, the cosmos together. And um, it, uh, it, yeah, it's, it's God, it is the Lord who is holding um, this, the universe or the cosmos together and the so-called scientific laws which are interwoven into the cosmos. These are expressions of his his uh, attributes. God is imminent, that is close to um, his creation because of his involvement with upholding his creation while remaining transcendent. You see, all religions either overemphasize the transcendence of God to, neg to ne the neglect of his personal nature, or they so emphasize his imminence, his closeness to creation, that he's not absolute or transcended at all. And that's what we see in the New Age Cosmic Christ. Um, the, the, the two are um, identified, really. So, But the, the uh, Cosmic Christ's work did not stop at creation, but extended into a cosmic redemption as well. The, quote, elementary principles, or stoicheia in Greek, mentioned in Colossians, are the demonic forces behind philosophies like the New Age Cosmic Christ. Ironically, the real Cosmic Christ came to destroy the Cosmic Christ forces of today. It's, it's terribly um, ironic, and uh, she causes us to weep. Um, the, the cosmic Christ of the New Age is an expression of an antichrist distortion because they deny all the biblical content of the real cosmic Christ. The real cosmic Christ, Jesus of Nazareth, the second person of the Trinity incarnate, 
He disarmed the devil and his adversaries, chapter 2, verse 15, which we read, which was an act of cosmic redemption for us. In addition to dying for our sins, the Lord Jesus died to defeat the cosmic forces arrayed against him and against us. And again, in supreme irony, many folks refer to nature spirits as elementals, but they don't realize that the term itself means demonic spirits and teaching for which the cosmic Christ came to deliver us from such darkness and ignorance. You see, it's, it's God's nature, it's the cosmic Christ's nature, and demons, they're not going to protect, you know, the nature and any part of it. Um, of God's nature, uh, the only way that they'll, quote, protect it is if they are attached to it and are being territorial. But in verse 20, we see that his reconciliation was cosmic in scope. This was affected by, as it says, his blood. Christ's atoning death was cosmic in its scale and intent. And since he is God as well as man, that means his death can have a cosmic dimension to it. So we see again how the person and a work of the cosmic Christ affect each other. So it's not, if it was just a man, it would just be one man working for another. But this is the God man. So the cross, please listen, this is important. The cross is a pivotal point, not only in human history, but cosmic history as well. I'll say that again. So the cross is a pivotal point, not only in human history, but cosmic history as well. His victory will be embraced by us believers when he returns and enforced on unbelievers and Satan and demons when Christ comes back. In Romans 8, we see nature personified in that it is said to groan for the full application of Christ's cosmic redemption as far as a curse is found. As that lovely hymn sin says, what Christ created, he will recreate at his second coming, and his blood ensured this reconciliation. There is a now not yet tension to the cosmic Christ redemption. Now he reigns victorious and has defeated his enemies through the cross. Chapter 2, verse 15. But it will not be until his return that the full effects of the fall will be reversed. The Lord Jesus is the true cosmic Christ in who he is and what he has done in creation and redemption. In truth, he is infinitely beyond cosmic because he not only um, he is not restricted to just the vastness of the cosmos of the universe. He created it. One day we shall see the true cosmic Christ face to face in all his infinite beauty. In the meantime, let us remember that the cosmic Christ is both transcendent and imminent, the holy creator who is God with us. Amen.